So if you are new here at The Well, welcome. My name is Maddie Robinson, and I am actually the worship pastor here at The Well. So normally I'm up there with my team. But today, Dylan, who is the pastor here, which is also my husband, he thought it would be cool that for the last message of this series that I would get up here and I would kind of share. Uh, I can tell you whether what he's been saying about our marriage is true or not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everything he said is true. Everything he has said, I have given him permission to say. <laughs> But anyway, Dylan has mentioned this just a little bit, but I kind of want to go into more detail because I think it's, it's important for us to know and it, it's cool to understand. But the premarital counseling tool we use here at The Well is called SIMBIS, and it stands for Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. <clears throat> it's an incredible thing. It is very extensive. Okay, so what this looks like. As each couple, they go separately and they take this long test. There's so many questions that they have to answer. They answer individually and then their answers are combined into this document. And this document is like 17 pages long. Like I said, it's very extensive. And then what happens is that document gets sent to the facilitator, not to the couple. So they can't talk about it and kind of change their answers before they sit down with someone. So they sit down with the facilitator and then they can go over things. And in the, the reason that Symbus is there is not to tell you you shouldn't get married. It's not to tell you these are problems you're for sure going to have. But the, the goal is to say, these are your answers. We compiled them. Maybe these are some areas where you need to have some extra conversations. These are just some areas that this could be a caution flag. This could be a red flag later on in your marriage. So, hey, why don't you deal with it now instead of having to deal with it later in your marriage, which is great. So Dylan and I, we did premarital counseling. It looked different than Symbis, but it was great. I mean, there were things that we talked about. It was awesome. But then, two years into marriage, we decided to take Symbis because Dylan was becoming a facilitator. And the document got sent to Dylan, and we sat down, and we looked at it together. And if I'm being honest, I think I just started, like, having tears just roll down my face. Because if I'm being honest, at that point in time, I was not as emotionally mature as I am now. And it was very hard for me to articulate things at times. But when you're sitting there reading something that's telling you, hey, watch out for this in your marriage, and you're currently struggling with that in your marriage, these are things that you're currently fighting about in marriage. These are kind of things that are currently just not quite right. You kind of have a choice, okay? Um, we could have read that and decided to just ignore it, and then our marriage was not going to get any better. Or we could decide to work on those things and to actually take what this is saying and do something with it, which I can honestly say standing up here today, we have worked so much on our marriage and it's not like we ever had a horrible marriage, but I mean, we needed to grow. We needed to, to take what this was saying and, and we needed to figure some things out, which is okay. That's the case in every marriage, I'm sure. But Dylan and I have sat with couples doing Symbis and not doing Symbis who are faced with things in their marriage, faced with very real things, whether they're about to get married or whether they've been married for a while. And it's pretty clear that the people who want, want to put in the work, they will. They will. They'll sit, they'll, they'll listen, they'll have those really hard conversations, they'll do what needs to be done in order to fix some of these things. And sadly, we have sat with couples who are not willing to do that. They are not willing to put in the work and sadly, their marriage has ended, or if it hasn't ended, they are kind of miserable in their marriage. And that's not what God has for us. But it reminds me of this quote from Fierce Marriage, and it says this, Love is an action and a choice. And marriage is the promise to choose love whenever a choice must be made. Contrary to popular thought, love doesn't happen to us. We choose it. We choose it, which we know that we choose love on our wedding day. We know that we stand up in front of our friends and in front of our family, and we're saying, I'm going to choose to love this person. We're getting married. I'm so excited. But love isn't just a choice one time, because if we choose love once on our wedding day, when things get hard, which they will, when circumstances, when situations change, which they will, if we don't continue to choose love, our love will die. Our love will continue to, or will stop existing. We will stop loving, which is very natural. 
but we have to choose to continue to love. So today I'm excited to preach this message to you called, I really do still love you. Can you say that with me? I really do still love you. I love that because I really do still love my husband. And in fact, I, I really do love him more than I did the day we got married. And I can honestly say that. But it's one thing to fall in love, which is great. Falling in love is so exciting. I didn't say this last service, but... I'm wearing my fancy bracelet that Dylan got for me when we first started dating. And it's one of those bracelets where you, like, add charms. And it's cool because when I get to look at this bracelet, I I can see different memories. I can see our first Valentine's Day, and I can see our first Christmas. And it's, it's exciting to fall in love. But what happens when we don't stay in love? Falling in love is great, but staying in love, staying in love is what it's all about. Amen? staying in love, but to continue to really love each other, you must continue to pursue each other. That's our focus today. I'm going to read it again. To continue to really love each other, you must continue to pursue each other. Because if we don't continue to pursue each other, we're going to start drifting apart. And we read this a little bit in the, in the scripture we talked about earlier. And the first thing that it says in 1 John is to let us continue. Let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. So we can assume that John is writing this because it was a problem, right? He's going to write this because he had noticed that people would love and then people would stop loving. People would step out of loving, whether it be a marriage or whether it be something else. This scripture isn't necessarily talking about marriage. It's just talking about really loving your neighbor, who your neighbor could be many different people. But we can, of course, apply this to our marriage. So if this was a problem here and this time, we can honestly say that it's definitely still a problem here in our time. It's very natural to drift apart. Very natural. It's kind of the human condition. I hate to say it, but if you look at worldly relationships and you look at world that, or love that the world has to offer, it's natural. But I'm not worried about the natural. I'm worried about the supernatural. So, so what does love, like in the, love look like in the supernatural? And that looks like God because love comes from God. God. And Dylan taught on this just a little bit in one of his sermons in this series, but before we can even start talking about love, we have to look at what God's love looks like. And and Dylan said this, but in our English language, we have one word for love. I love pizza. I love God. We have one word. But in the Bible, there are specific words for different kinds of love. And we see here we have our friendship love and we have our family love. Those are important. We're not really going to hit on those today. But then we have eros, which is romantic love. Or another word for it is sexual love, which, of course, is the love we have in a marriage. But before we can even talk about these three, we got to focus on this agape. Can you all say that with me? Agape love. And you notice that in this description right here, it doesn't just say unconditional love. Because I can get up here all day long. And I can tell you that I have unconditional love for Dylan or I have unconditional love for my kids. But without the Lord, if I'm being honest, whether I would like to admit it or not, there probably are some conditions because that's who we are as humans. But this says it's God's unconditional love. God's unconditional love because we serve a God without limits and we serve a God without limits conditions when it comes to loving because the very nature of God, the very character of God is to love because God is love. God is love. It's so important that we understand this. Eros love is great. We'll talk about it. Friendship love, family love, super important. We will talk about that as well. But we have to realize that the agape love comes first. And this looks like, this is a silly illustration, but, I mean, you could be the best person in the whole world, and God doesn't love you any more. And you can be the worst person in the whole world, and God doesn't love you any less because there are no conditions. We can do whatever, and his love remains the same which, like we said, is not exactly how we as humans are used to living. But how do we know if we have this agape love? Well, let's go back to the scripture we were reading. 
He goes on to say, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this is a very strong statement, and this is something that honestly can step on some toes. And if it steps on your toes, maybe this is an area that the Lord is kind of wanting to to come into your heart about because if I'm being honest, there's been times in my life where this has been difficult. And it's this whole idea that you can say you're a Christian all day long. You can say that you know these things about Jesus. You can say, you can quote scripture. You know, you can do Bible quizzing when you're a kid. You can do all of these things. But at the end of the day, do you have head knowledge? Do you just know who he is? Or do you truly know Jesus? It's the head knowledge versus the heart knowledge. Do you actually have a personal relationship with Jesus? You know, I follow Sadie Roberts and Huff. She's the Duck Dynasty girl on social media. And I can tell you who her husband is and I can tell you who her kids are. I can tell you lots of different things about her because of what she posts on social media. But at the end of the day, do I actually know Sadie Robertson? No. I don't. We don't have that personal relationship. And sadly, in the Bible Belt, which is where we live, where we live in a place where people know so many things about Jesus. They're like, oh, yeah, I know that, you know, Jesus rose from the dead on Easter, and I know what Christmas means, and those things are great. But we also live in an area where it's kind of an issue where we just don't have that personal relationship And that personal relationship is so important because if we don't have that, we actually don't know God and we cannot have this love. We cannot love in an eros or in the other types of ways if we do not have the heart knowledge, if we do not have this personal relationship with God, this agape love. But what does it look like? What does this agape truly look like? Because if we have this agape love, then how do we know, right? How do we know if we are operating in this love? And I think there's no better scripture to read in this than from the love chapter. So it's 1 Corinthians 13, and it's often called the love chapter because a lot of the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13 are found in weddings, and, you know, we always refer to it as that. But I want to read it this morning. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I love that. And as people, we are naturally inclined to love in different ways, and we are naturally inclined to be better at certain things than others. But when we read this, it's a really good indicator of where we're at. (laughs) Are we operating out of this agape love? And this is going to be very elementary. I understand I did this multiple times when I was a kid. I'm sure a lot of us have heard this. I think I did this in the teen group as well. But you've probably heard, well, hey, to test yourself, instead of the word love, let's take it out and let's put your own name. So I'm going to read this with my name. And as I'm reading this, truly, in your minds, I want you to put your own name in this and, and use it as kind of a test. So Maddie is patient and kind, sometimes. Maddie is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Maddie does not demand her own way, unless I really want to get my way. Maddie is not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. I said this last service, and, and Dylan gave me a big amen, but I, this week, as I'm studying for this message, I bring up something from the past, and, and then in the back of my brain, I was like, I am literally talking about this on Sunday. Don't keep records of being wrong. Anyway, still working on it, okay? Still working on it. And then it says, Maddie does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And this one, I think, is so important. Maddie never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Now, I understand we all fall short, but if we are operating in this agape love, our life will look more like this. And if there are certain lines in this where you're like, just like me, I'm reading some of these this week, and, and right now as I'm reading it, and I'm like, 
oh, maybe I need to let this agape love in a little bit more in some of these areas. That's a really good thing to do because if we don't have this agape love, what happens is that the first type of love to leave or the first type of love to not be as healthy as it should be is the eros love, which is this romantic love. And oftentimes relationships are almost only built on eros love. And what happens is if your relationship is only built on eros love, then what happens when things change in your relationship? What happens when there's just different seasons? If it's not rooted in this agape love, your marriage isn't going to make it. I mean, Eros love is fantastic, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I just want you to understand this morning how important it is to base your marriage, but every single relationship you have on this agape, on this unconditional love. Because like I said, what happens in a marriage is that this eros love, this romantic, this sexual love is something that just kind of goes out the window in a marriage if you're not rooted in that. And I want to read this scripture in 1 Corinthians, and it says, um, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. This is what it looks like to have eros love. It is sacrifice, but it's sacrifice in the most beautiful way, in the way that God has designed it. God has designed marriage, this holy matrimony. He designed it to be holy because he is holy, and this is a reflection of what it looks like between us and uh, the church and Jesus. So marriage is, is so important, but let's be honest. The world tells us a whole different story about sex and about intimacy. The, first of all, the world tells you that it doesn't need to be within the confines of this biblical marriage. And I'm here to tell you that's not right. It, it, it's designed to be in a marriage, in a holy, in a godly marriage. But then You know, we like to romanticize stuff on the TV. We see these TV shows and we see these romantic grand gestures on TV. And I've even had conversations with people and I've heard people say, well, I just wish that would happen to me. And I'm like, you are in a relationship. You are married. What are you doing in order to have a marriage like that? We idolize other people and we idolize things that we see on the TV, which more times than not are so worldly And we think, I would never, I could never have that. But we don't do anything to try to work on those things in our marriage. We don't do anything to try to pursue our spouse. If we aren't pursuing God and we aren't pursuing our spouse, we're not going to have Eros love. We're going to have, if I'm being honest, a very twisted, a very worldly kind of love. And when intimacy in a marriage, or dare I say the lack thereof, when it's, When it's kind of faltered in a marriage, it can be the cause. This can be the cause of a struggling marriage. And also this can be the result of a struggling marriage. So this can be the thing that's kind of off or if anything else in your relationship is kind of off. This is a really good indicator on what's going on. So if, honestly, it's it's time to get real. That's what this whole series is about. It's time to get real. You think I want to be up here talking about sex with my grandparents and my parents in here? No, I don't. But I think it's so important that the church talks about this. And not only the church, but a woman talking about it as well. Because let's be honest, I've been in the crowd sometimes when a guy gets up here and they start talking about this. And they're like, well, I've submitted to your husbands. And they're like, give authority of your body to your... And, and, but sometimes we tune out because we're like, well, they don't understand. But this is biblical. This is not an opinion. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible designed this to be. The world perverts this. Even in marriage, the world perverts this. And it's just, it's just not, it's not how God designed it. God designed it as a gift. God designed it as this special thing where husband and wife can unite and come together as one flesh because that is what the Bible calls us to do in a marriage. 
And last thing I will say about this, and I actually said something very similar in a message last year I preached about this, but if this is something that you are having trouble with in your marriage, and it goes so much deeper than just sex, it's an, it's an intimacy problem, it's a pursuit problem, it's time to have some hard conversations, okay? I can't get up here and tell you what this should look like. I can't get up here. What I can say is that it's not biblical. It's not okay to just ignore it and just, like, hope this goes away. It's not biblical to just tell your husband or tell your wife, sorry, I'm not doing that. You give authority. Whether you like it or not, the day you got married, you gave authority over your body to your spouse, and your spouse gave authority over their body to you. And through agape love, that is the most beautiful thing. It is the most beautiful picture. But without the agape love, I'm telling you, things get messed up. So you got to fix your eyes on God and then you got to start pursuing your spouse again. And I have a question. Do you need God's help to pursue your spouse again? Because we've already talked about this. We can't do this on our own. Do you need God's help? Do you need his help to show you, to show you how to pursue again, to show you how to love your spouse the way they need to be loved and if the answer is yes, which the answer for me is yes, I mean, I feel like our marriage is stronger than it's ever been, but I still need God's help to know how to pursue Dylan more. I still need God's help. I, we can never arrive, right? We can never just get to a place someday and be like, all right, I've got things all figured out. No, things are constantly changing and, and situations are changing and it's always a constant pursuit. Pursue is this action word. You don't pursue once, you keep pursuing and you keep pursuing. But how does this work? A lot of you probably are like, yeah, I do need God's help, but where do I even start? And the whole time I've been processing through this message and the whole time I've been preparing for this message, there is one thing that the Lord has been speaking to me over and over and over again. And I had to look up this scripture. It's a scripture in Revelation. It won't be on the screen because I'm just going to briefly hit on it. But the idea of it is that we have to come back to our first love. Come back to your first love. Jesus is speaking in the scripture, and he says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Is that you this morning? And who's our first love? Our first love is not our spouse. Our first love is not our kids, even though a lot of us think that our kids. No, it's not our neighbor. Our first love is God. That's our first love. That's where we have to start. So if you're like, yeah, I need God's help, but what do I do? Come back. Come back to your first love. That scripture also says, look how far you've fallen. That stuck out to me so much this week. Look how far you have fallen. So this kind of has a lot of different ways you can look at it. So first of all, look at your relationship with Jesus. And remember when you met him for the first time and when you got saved and the time you were so excited and you were so passionate and you wanted to read the scriptures and you wanted to pray, what are you looking like right now? Like it's time that we have to self-reflect. It's time to get real. Look how far you have fallen. Have you fallen this morning, if you are evaluating your relationship with the Lord right now in this very moment, what does it look like compared to when you first met him? What does it look like? Some of you, I hope, can say, yeah, my relationship's a lot closer than then. And that's amazing. That's how it should be. And some of you don't fully comprehend this because you have not met Jesus at all yet. And to that, I would say, don't come back to your first love, but fall in love for the first time. Fall in love with Jesus and accept this free gift of salvation for the first time. But then there are some of you in here who, look how far you've fallen. Your relationship with the Lord is, is further away than you ever thought was possible. You still believe. You still know the things that you know. But you have fallen. And then you can apply this to your marriage as well to any relationship, but especially a marriage. Look how far you've fallen in a marriage. 
self-reflect, look at who you were the day you got married and how excited you were. And I just remember walking down the aisle and just seeing Dylan and being so excited because you're like, I'm about to start the rest of my life with this person. But who you are sitting here today, have you fallen away from your spouse? Do you guys not love each other the way that you did at first? Now, this message is important, and, and the wording is important. I want you to understand this, that to continue to love, to continue to love your spouse is how we are wording this. We're not saying to continue to be married. Now, hear my heart. <laughs> I think we should stay married. Hear my heart. It's biblical. I'm not talking about, but how do you continue to love? I don't want us to be miserable how many times do we not get real and our marriages are, are struggling? And if we're being honest, things, I had a conversation the other day. They were struggling, but they wouldn't be real about it because they were worried about their reputations or they were worried about what people would say. You got to get real because a biblical marriage is not just surviving and a biblical marriage is not just being so miserable and just saying, well, I got myself into this mess. I got to see it through. No, a biblical marriage is a thriving marriage. A biblical marriage is a marriage that on this side of heaven, in this earth, the relationship that I have with my husband is the most life-giving relationship that I have. I mean, it's incredible. And I understand that, you know, we can't get our worth from people, we gotta get our worth from God, we gotta get our satisfaction from God, all those things. I understand that, but in a worldly relationship, a marriage should give you the most satisfaction out of any other worldly relationship. It should be incredible. God designed it that way, but we have it twisted. And we just think that we can't get out of it. We think that this is how it's going to be forever. And listen, elephant in the room, I know, I understand someone like me getting up here, some of you tuned me out, some of you are like, you're just young, you're just naive, you don't know what you're talking about, you've not been married very long, you've not been through certain life experiences that I have been through, and I understand that, but hear me when I say this. I have read this in scripture time and time again. And I have experienced this in my own life time and time again. And I have watched God do this time and time again. So whether you believe this right now or not, I am telling you that God is a God of restoration. That God is a God of transformation. That God is a God of second chances. That God is a God of miracles. Does anyone believe that in here this morning? Let's all stand. We're about to go into a time of response. But listen, like, like, God wants the best for you. Do you, do, you under, do you comprehend what that means? God doesn't want you to be miserable. God doesn't want you to just feel stuck. No, God wants you to thrive. Like, God wants you to have such a joy-filled life. And so many Christians, oh, I've talked to so many people who their marriage is one of the reasons why they are not walking in this joy-filled life because it is just hard. It is just hard sometimes. And I understand that. And I understand that it's overwhelming because some of you agree with all of this. Some of you are like, yeah, I understand. I get it. Like, I need to pursue God. And then I get it. Like, I need to pursue my spouse. But I literally do not know where to start. Or it just seems so far away that I cannot fathom how the Lord is going to do this. And if that's you this morning, I'm going to give you some advice. And this is advice my mom gives me when I'm feeling overwhelmed. And she says, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. A marriage is not going to just be better, okay? 
And we understand that. But how do you heal a marriage? How do you fix a marriage? It's through one prayer at a time. It's through one Bible reading at a time. It's through one conversation with your spouse at a time. It's through one counseling session or meeting if that's what you need at a time. It's one kiss at a time. It's one act of love at a time. You have to take the step. It's time to get real because if you don't get real about it and if you don't come to this place where you understand that things are not as they seem, the Lord is not going to fix it. God is a gentleman. God is not going to just intervene in your life if you don't want him to. And that's why our relationship with God has to be first. (laughs) It has to be first. Like we we cannot live, we cannot operate in a healthy way without it. But if we let God in, oh man, if we let him in, we let him come in and and fill our hearts. And if we start living through the spirit and living through the power of the Holy Spirit, oh, he'll point out the steps to take. And it'll look different between your marriage and that marriage. The steps might look a little bit different, but if you are operating through the Holy Spirit, the Lord will show you which steps to take. He will show you what you need to work on. He will show you how you need to pursue your spouse in this way. He will show you what to do, but you have to believe it, for one. You have to believe that he wants that for you, and you have to believe that he will do that. I think a lot of times we think, you know, God can do anything, but no, God can do anything, period. God can do anything, exclamation point. He can do anything, and he wants to move in our relationships, and he wants to move in our marriages. So we're going to go in time into this time of response. Father, Lord, God, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for what you're going to do because I believe it. Lord, I've seen it already, and I believe that you're going to work, and I believe that you're going to move in our marriages. God, I pray that we get out of the way. God, I pray that we lay our pride aside. I pray that you fill us with humility in order for us to get real and for in order for us to realize that, no, Lord, I, I do have a problem, but you want to intervene. God, I pray that you are speaking to people, Lord. If people don't know you yet, I pray that they fall in love with you this morning, God. And if people need to come back to their first love, Lord, whether they are married or whether they are divorced or or single or dating or whatever, God, I pray that we would all come back, come back to our first love. Lord, that's you. God, I pray that we come back to you, Lord, in my own life. God, I pray that I never forget what it's like to be so in love with you. And I pray that I never forget what it's like to be so in love with you with my spouse. Lord, you can do anything. God, I believe it. And I declare that in this place this morning, Lord. I pray that you are speaking. I pray that you are moving even when we can't see it. Lord, work in this place this morning. Amen.